Mr. Jenner, let's take our Bibles now and let's turn to the book of Colossians, chapter number 3, please. Colossians chapter number 3, Wednesday night, Bible study and prayer meeting. And so, hope you have your Bibles with you. If not, then just listen carefully and we'll try to teach you something that the Lord has shown me. And uh, Colossians chapter number 3, and we'll begin reading in verse 12. When you find that, if you stand with me, please, out of respect to the Word of God, I'd be thankful to you. If there's one thing this world is not suffering from, it's too much respect for God's Word. I suspect just the opposite is true. And so that's what we need is more respect and heeding of the Word of God. So Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 12. It says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now tonight, I want to focus on the first two verses that I read you. We'll talk about how to deal with injuries. How to deal with injuries. And so let's pray together you can be seated. Father, we do thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you for letting us have a church. And that during the holiday week on a Wednesday night, uh, we have a good many people here. We're grateful for that. And I just pray that you reward them for being here. Help, Help us not to be distracted but to listen and heed the Word of God, and I pray that you would help me, though I am not the most efficient messenger, that I would be faithful to the text and that you'd use me in some way tonight as I yield myself to you, wonderful Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Um, I, I, I probably should have put some thought into remembering the first time I was ever hurt by someone else as a young adult or as an adult. But I'll just lead off by saying that anywhere you have people that you interact with, you are at risk to be injured. I don't mean physically, although that certainly can be the case in this crazy world we live in, but I'm talking about someone hurting you uh, as a personal offense. That is true of families within the home, Extended families, and I've witnessed that through the years. I had a church member in my church in Ohio when we served there that the two brothers uh, wouldn't speak, and they were very, very much at odds one with the other. It was um, concerning a company deal that one of them had to fire the other one, and it was tough and terrible, and it ruined their relationship. They allowed it to ruin their relationship. I have seen that in families. I have seen it in in companies. Most of you work somewhere where there are people, unless you work by yourself. And so you've got to deal with people. You've got to work with other people. And sometimes people don't say and do what they should. Sometimes they say and do what they shouldn't. And it hurts you. Sometimes someone may let you down or may talk about you, may do something that hurts you. It happens in churches. And the truth is that the closer church people are together and the more time you spend together, the more at risk you are to see that happen. I'll tell you who never gets their feelings hurt here by the other members. Now, they might get their feelings hurt by what I say, but is someone who is just lightly attached to the church and who just sort of comes and goes maybe once a week or once a month and they don't really know anyone well, and they just come in like you go to a ball game and go home, and they may enjoy the services, but they don't interact, and they don't, they're not in, as we say. And those people are at very low risk to be hurt by some other church member here because they don't really know anybody very well. But once you get beyond just the superficial, like you go to the grocery store involvement in a, in a church, then you, you're going to find out that people in church are people. And, and sometimes 
you can be hurt by them, and sometimes you can do the hurting yourself. And sometimes that is intentional, usually it's not intentional. And sometimes it is perceived and not actual. And I would just say this, this is not really part of my talk, but I would just say this, that over the years I have observed at least as much perceived offense that wasn't actual as I have actual offense. But in the, in the end of that, the damage of a perceived offense is just as bad as one that actually happened if it's not dealt with properly. And so, you know, you can just mark it down that whether it be within the four square walls of your home or whether it be in your company or whether it be in your church family, if you know people well, you interact with them much at all, there's a really good chance at some point that there's going to be a little issue of injury between you. And what we have here in this couple of verses is we have a formula to help us deal with it. To help us deal with injuries that happen between the two of us. And the truth is I've never seen exactly what I'm going to share you until this week and I just began to work on this. Really, you know, sometimes when you're studying the Bible, you think you're going to teach one thing, you end up teaching something altogether different. And as I dug and looked here, I thought, well, you know, there's something else here I hadn't planned on teaching. And of course, as a church, we will soon be going through the book of Colossians, but I, so I shied away from this, but I thought, no, this is what the Lord wants. And so uh, this is going to be very teachy, as we say. So you've got to listen carefully because I guarantee you this, every one of us needs what you're going to hear. And you may not have any issues right now with someone, but you have had in the past, and you're going to have them in the future again. And so we all are. That's just part of being uh, part of the human family, so to speak. Now, also by way of introduction, I need to introduce three words to you and briefly explain those words in our text. The first one is the last word as it appears in the passage, and that is the word quarrel. The word quarrel. Now, it's interesting. Everybody in here probably thinks, well, I know what that word means, but in this text, it means something maybe slightly different than what you would expect. And it means this. It means an occasion for complaint. It means that someone has done something to you that is a just occasion or a perceived occasion for you to complain. That's what that word quarrel in this passage means. And so someone has done something that gives us an occasion to complain. The other word is the word forbear or forbearing. Also found that Ephesians chapter 4 that we are to forbear one another. I have said in the past that that word forbear in this context means to put up with someone, and it does, but it's a little richer word than that, and it involves things like patience. It involves things that, that it, 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 a word like restraint. Forbearing really means to restrain from action. It means that instead of doing what you think you should do, you don't do anything. You restrain yourself. And the word restrain implies that you want to do something, you feel like you should do something, and you tell yourself, no, I'm not going to do that. It, it implies that you want to maybe say something. Maybe get something off your chest, as we say. But that you should not. You should leave it where it is. And then the word forgive, which we pretty well got that word what it means, although we struggled to practice it, I think. But the word forgive, it means to send away a debt. And so just as if you borrowed $10 from me, and I don't usually carry that kind of big money, but if you borrowed $10 from me, and then you were supposed to pay it back on Friday, and uh, you did not pay it back, and you said, I can't pay it back, then I have a couple of options, but one of them is I can forgive the debt. Which means that you no longer owe me that $10 because I have declared the debt forgiven. And so, uh, 
this whole thing we're going to talk about begins with an offense. It begins with a, a just or perceived reason, an occasion that someone has given me to complain. And you might say to confront them. But what we have here is a formula. We have a two-step formula that God has given us here that will work, as we say every time it's tried, about what to do when these offenses come our way. And by the way, let me say this. As an observer of people now for many years, some of us wear our feelings on our shirt sleeves. And there are times when you just need to get over it and not let the least little thing tear you up. You've got to grow a little bit of a thicker skin than sometimes what we have. And if I were to be offended over every word that someone said to me that I didn't like, I'd stay tore up all the time. And um, as it is, I just stay tore up 94.5% of the time. <laughs> Two-part formula, I want you to see what it is in verse 13. We're given this formula. It is, verse 13 says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. There it is. Forbearing and forgiving. Forbearing and forgiving. Now, that is a formula, and here's what that means. The first part, to forbear, it means that it's how, it concerns how I respond or how I react to the, to the offense. And the word forbear there means this. It means, oh, by the way, it also carries with it, I said earlier a little bit about what it means, but also carries with it the idea of bearing a burden. So I am to restrain myself, I am not to act or not to speak, and I am to carry whatever was done to me. In other words, it's sort of like I am to just absorb it and not react. That's what forbear means. So part one is, on the receiving end of the offense, what do I do? Nothing. I do not respond, I do not react, I do not retaliate, and that's what we're talking about, as opposed to punching right back. As opposed to telling everybody I know what so-and-so did to me. And by the way, let me just remind you that the first, if you are going to confront someone or, or talk to someone about an offense, they should be the first person you talk to, not the other 39 people that you know. And there's many reasons for that, and one of them is this, that if you happen, and I know this never happened to you, but if you happen to have a perceived but not actual offense, but yet you've gone around and told those other 39 people what so-and-so did to you, what they said to you, what they didn't do, I guarantee you, you will never go back to those 39 and undo that. You can't even do it. That's one of the problems with putting stuff on Facebook. My word, what are you thinking putting stuff on Facebook? about what somebody said to you. You always know, well, I, well people that do so-and-so, you hear it coming. I just hope, you know, anyway, I, I wish y'all hadn't brought that up. But <laughs> people want to get that off their chest right away. And then everybody's like, oh, are you, what's wrong with you? Uh, well, what's wrong with you is you're not smart enough to keep it off Facebook. But um, so part one concerns how we initially react to the, in, to the injury we are to forbear, not retaliate, not repay, not avenge, and not attack. It means we are to patiently endure the injury. In other words, we, we take it on the chin. That's what it really means. Now, that's not natural for us. We don't really like doing that. We like for other people to do it. But we don't so much like to do it. But step one is you, you take it. You accept it. You receive it without any action against the person who did it. You forbear it. Forbearing one another. Illustration. Years ago, 
when I served as an assistant pastor in another church. I had a big Sunday school class. It was about this big, maybe a little bigger. And um, there was one lady. Her name was Mrs. Taylor. And she would always sit and scowl at me when I was teaching. And so, you know, you, you can't judge somebody by their face when, you know, when I'm looking at you, if you look like you are angry or whatever, I, I try not to let that compute because you may not really be. You may just not be feeling well. But she looked mad the whole time. And so she would come some and she wouldn't come some. Her husband was pretty faithful. And so I was visiting. I was always very kind to them, and they were polite to me. But I was visiting their home one day, just trying to encourage them to, to be at Sunday school. And she said, well, you know what? I'm just going to tell you something. I don't like you. <laughs> and I thought, well, how could you not like me? I'm wonderful. <laughs> Perfect in every way. And so I said, well, let me tell you something, you rotten heifer. Uh, no, I didn't say that. That's what you thought I'd say. That's, and, and, and by the way, I want to say, let me tell you something, you're, you're a rascal, you. I don't like you either. Or the horse you rode in on. But, uh, and I, 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 look, I'm flesh. I'm a reverend, but I'm fleshly, right? And so I said, I said, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you don't like me. I said, I like you. That was the biggest lie I ever told. I like you, I said i like to punch you in the nose, your husband too. I said, I like you. I didn't retaliate. And I didn't tell anybody except y'all, and it's been 20 years. So I guess I'm safe. <laughs> I forbear, forbearing that. I, and by the way, she kept coming some. And she's sitting right over there, I'm thinking, she doesn't like me. She doesn't told me she doesn't like me. And I was always nice to her. I, I tried to let it go in one ear, not the other. I did not respond. I did not retaliate. I did not attack her back. I didn't chew her out. I didn't even correct her. Let me tell you something. Someone does not have to like me to be a good person. Amen. And just because somebody doesn't care for me does not mean they're a terrible person. And the same thing goes for you. Don't judge someone just by how they treat you. Should I say that again? Don't judge anyone just by how they treat you. If that's all you've got as a Christian, you don't have enough yet. Just because they don't treat you well doesn't mean they don't treat everybody well. I'm not saying that, that they're doing right by you. I'm not saying that, that you, know, you shouldn't be saddened, but I'm saying that, you know, don't just paint with a big brush that says, oh, they're bad to me, so they're bad. They're rude to me, so they're rude. I mean, look, everybody else in my class that I know of liked me fine. She didn't. Okay, that's her business. I tried uh, <clears throat> my tie, I think, what it was. Um, <laughs> she didn't grace my ears with, with the why, but she just didn't like me. And so, uh, so I tried very hard, as best I could, to win her over. You know, I tried to win her over. I didn't succeed. I think she still, if she saw me, would say, I don't, still don't like you. It's been a long time. Maybe she, she would change her mind. But I, I tried to be forbearing. I just accept, I carried that. I just accepted that. I didn't fight against her. I didn't retaliate against her. I just took it. And that's part one. The second half is to forgive. Now see, here's the thing. If you don't forbear, and listen carefully, if you don't forbear, it's almost impossible to forgive. Because once you put your dukes up, and you go to fighting back at them, you just made it almost impossible for you to forgive. Because once you put a good licking on somebody, what you're going to do, you're going to justify that. You're going to justify it. But if you hold back, you hold your fire, you hold your tongue, you, hold your, you restrain yourself, you forbear it, you take it, you carry it. All right? Now, you've, you've called what we like to call Christian character. And because you just have absorbed it, then you can put yourself 
more easily in a frame of mind whereby you can forgive what was done. So, let me, let me uh, come here, Brother Patrick. I'll pick on you just a minute. I love to pick on Patrick because he smiles all while I'm doing it. Now, stand right here, sir. So now, um, here's Patrick, and I'm going to injure him. I'm going to break his kneecap right here in front of God and everybody. No, I'm, I'm going to injure him, and we're going to do a physical thing. Uh, by the way, these are registered with FBI. But um, I'm going to do a physical thing, but you just pretend like it's not a physical thing, okay? So I'm going to injure him. I shoved him, right? I shoved him. You like that, don't you? Yeah, one more time. Huh? Now, you see what he did? Nothing. He's forbearing it. I picked him. One reason was because he's close to the front. Um, he doesn't carry a weapon that I know of. I picked him because I really believe that's the kind of man he is. See, I push him. Look at him. He's smiling. Now, he doesn't like it. I mean, look, he doesn't like that. But look at his smile. Now, what he, he didn't just, his gut reaction was not just to, and then push me back. I mean, he could have pushed me back like that, or pushed me back like that. But he didn't do it. He is forbearing my injury. He could have put up his dukes. He could have called me something ugly like a Presbyterian or a Democrat. Um, but he didn't do it. He just absorbed it. Now, look at his face. Turn. <laughs> Does he look angry to you? Uh-uh. He has a soft, gentle spirit. And I've just pushed him all over the platform. Did you hear that? He said, mm-hmm. He's starting to burr up just a little bit. Uh, Probably should stop because he is bigger than I am. Um, but he's, he's got a soft spirit still. Now, if he had pushed me back and he had said some ugly things to me, then we'd be in a full-blown fight. And he would have a very hard time forgiving because he's fighting me now. It's hard to have a soft, forgiving spirit when you're pushing somebody back. Another thing is created is because I'm pushing on him and he's not pushing me back, at some point that may convict me. Because I'm hurting him, he's not hurting me back. So, because he is forbearing, he is just accepting that. Now, he's not liking it, but he's accepting that, and he's not fighting me back. Then, you know, after I've shoved him a few times, and I'm thinking, okay, he, he should have pushed me back. He should have said something, but he didn't. Now I really feel bad. And it may move me to seek his forgiveness. Say, look, man, I'm sorry. You didn't even push me back. I'm so sorry I pushed you. Would you please forgive me? Shocking. Are you a really, a, you're not a Baptist. Are you? Are you a Baptist? And you still forgave me? Wow. You know I'm the preacher, right? You, you forgave the preacher of shoving you? That's a shock. All right. But because I, he didn't push me back, and then his lack of aggression back to me not only kept his spirit soft, it softened my spirit, and then I feel really bad. And I say, look, man, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Why do, I don't know why I did that. I guess because it was fun. Um, I don't know why I did that. Would you please forgive me? He says, yes. So now if his forgiveness is immediate, complete, and forever, which is what all real forgiving is, 
Some of us put a, we put a time limit on our forgiveness. It wears out in a month. Go ahead and you sit back down. Thank you, by the way. By the way, uh, you might want to work out. You're a little soft. Uh, I want to... Uh, Some of us, we, for, we say we forgive, but it's like you ever put a timer on and it ding after about a minute or two. That's what happens to your forgiveness. It runs out after a little bit. See, real forgiveness is, is a quick. It is complete. You don't 75% forgive someone. You either forgive them or you don't. And you, I'll tell you how you can tell. If you still think they owe you something, you haven't forgiven them yet. You say, I forgave them, but they never, did, they never did do so and so. Well, guess what? If you're thinking like that, then you probably think they still owe you, you hadn't forgiven them. That's your trouble. Forgiveness is you owe me nothing. You owe me nothing. You don't owe me a smile, you owe me absolutely zero. Um, that's one reason why, as a church, we don't loan money to our church members or anybody else. You know why? Because I don't want to have to forgive that debt. I don't want to have to say, look, because most of the time folks that want to borrow money can't pay you back. If they could, they wouldn't need the money. We don't, we don't lend money because I don't want to have to say to someone, you owe us. I'd more, be more likely to give you money than I would to, to loan you money. I'm broke. But uh, now here's the thing. To get to the place where Patrick was, to be able to forbear and to forgive, you have to grow into that as a Christian. You have to grow into it. You have to develop your Christian maturity to the point to where you can forbear and forgive. And what happens there is given to us in verse 12. The ingredients, if you will, of someone who's able to forbear and forgive, what it, what it requires in a person, there are seven things here. I'm going to try to give them to you really quick and be out by 15 after. Seven, I guess you might call them prerequisites so that you are able to forbear and forgive. And they are given to us in our text here in verse 12. Let's read that again very quickly. Look at your Bibles. It says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. So, and then you see a semicolon. So what we have here is we have these seven things, because I lumped two of them together. These seven things are prerequisites that build you spiritually to the place where you are able to forbear. And by the way, forbearing is maybe the hardest part of this just to take it on the chin and absorb it without retaliation. These seven things is really the heart of what I want to talk to you about, and I'm going to try to do it as quickly as I can, and that means about two minutes per point-ish. Seven prerequisites for being able to forbear and forgive. Number one, look at this, it says, put on. Put on, therefore. And then it lists these other things. Point number one is forbearing and forgiving requires a decision to do so. If you want to be the kind of person that is able to respond the way Patrick did, to be a forbearing, forgiving person, there has to be a point in your life where you decide, this is the kind of person I'm going to be. You can't trust yourself just to have the right knee-jerk reaction. Because that rarely will happen. If your knee jerk is like my knee jerk, it doesn't usually go very well. But if you decide, you know what, I, I want to be someone who is able to forbear and then forgive, you have to say to yourself, look, I, this is who I want to be. And you have to try to make that a life policy. You know, we have church policies. I just mentioned one to you about loaning money. We also have many other policies. Your company has policies about what time you open, what time you close. Your boss doesn't get up every morning and say, I'm just going to pray and see what time we ought to open today. 
You have a time to start, time to quit, probably have a lunch time. You have duties. It's policy. Policy. Well, look, if a company can have policies, then you can have a policy for your own life. I have policies in my own personal life about a, a number of things, just the way I handle myself in certain situations. And so you ought to have policies for your life, and one of them should be that you make a decision, I'm going to be a forbearing and forgiving person. If someone offends me, I'm, going to, I'm, just going to, I'm determined that I'm going to grow in my faith to the place where I can just do nothing about it immediately. I won't respond, react, I just absorb it. That's a decision you have to make. And I say that because I know so many people, their minds are already made up the other way. Nobody's going to talk to me like that. Nobody's going to treat me like that. I tell you right now, I'll punch them right in the nose. Look, too many people who name the name of Christ have a hair trigger and they're ready to blow it. They're ready to pop a cork. You say the least little thing to them, they're all, all too eager to get up in your face. By the way, that is a mark of a very immature Christian. I don't, know how, I don't care how long you've been saved. I know people 70 years old been saved 40 years, and they still have a hair trigger that, that boy, you, you do the wrong thing in the traffic, they'll be all up in your face, blowing the horn, telling you you're number one. And uh, you've got to know that those people are immature. You've got to decide, look, I'm going to forbear, I'm going to be a forgiving person. Number two, forbearing and forgiving requires we accept it as our Christian duty. It says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. In other words, the, the, the phrase really means as Christians are supposed to do. He's saying, look, you put these things on as Christians should. It is what you owe your master for bearing his name. Amen. This is not something that you do not owe God. You owe him... I owe him the ability to grow into the place where I can be forbearing and forgiving and do anything less than that. I'm not paying my debt to God. When you owe something, when it's a duty, that means you owe it. It is not optional. See, if I see it as being my duty to take it on the chin for my Lord when someone offends me just to say nothing back, just to do nothing back, to spread no rumors about what they've done, and just to take it on the chin and smile. That's what I owe my God. And by the way, if you have a struggle with that, just remember all the times that you and I have received that from Him. Listen, God doesn't have a hair trigger with you. If he did, you'd already be toast. God is very forbearing. I was talking to him on the way to church, and I'm thinking, boy, this year, I just don't feel like I was in my groove this year, and I just apologize to the Lord for all kinds of stuff I didn't do that I should have done or didn't do as fervently as I should have done. And I'm thinking, you know, Lord, you should have, you should have really whooped me good. I didn't quite half mean that. But, you, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, if he had a hair trigger, he'd have shot me a hundred times this last year. So I have been, I have received that forbearing, I have received that forgiving, and you know, there's some sermons I preach. And I think, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. That, that wasn't nice, that wasn't good. And I can tell that someone that it might have hurt a little bit, well, they came back, they're back, and they seem to just have been forbearing with me and forgiving with me, and they keep on Loving me and keep on listening to me, you see. So I've, I've received that. And I'm sure I have uh, received this forbearing and forgiving probably more times than I've given it. Number three, forbearing and forgiving requires a merciful heart. Bowels, it says bowels of mercy. Now that phrase, bowels of mercy, the, the, in the Bible when you see the word bowels, it's talking about your inner self, your heart. But notice it is the plural, mercies. It could have said bowels of mercy. But the word mercies implies that it covers a wide array of subjects over a long period of time. It is not just a one-time act of mercy. See, in other words, what did I deserve when I pushed him to be pushed back? 
What does I deserve when I pushed him again? To be socked in the nose. But because before he ever stood there, he has bowels of mercies, I pushed him five or six times. He never pushed me back. He never hit me back. He never said a word. Bowels of mercies. You have to be someone who has that sympathy, that soft heart to say, you know, I'm not going to give them what they have earned from me. We believe in tit for tat, right? In other words, you hurt me, I hurt you. You talk about me, I talk about you. That's not the way it's supposed to work. The world's supposed to do that. We're not supposed to do that. It implies, the, the little phrase, bowels of mercy, implies that mercy is a way of life. That my um, application of mercy is a way of life. It is the way I live. It is who I am to be merciful. I'll say this. I, I'm going to speak plainly to you when necessary. I'm going to preach the Bible to you with all the fervency and the plainness that I can muster. I will cut no corners to keep you in that chair. And I'm going to preach against every known manner of sin that I can possibly think of in the Bible. But I'll say this too, if you blow it, there's mercy. And that is my predisposition, is to be merciful. If someone blows it, if someone does something horrific, mercy. What I'm saying is, bowels of mercy means that is your gut reaction to be merciful. We've had several situations here that were real tough, where people did some really ridiculous things. My gut reaction in every case was mercy. In fact, on the one, you know, in, in 15 and a half years, we have exercised church discipline once. And the hardest part of that was me talking myself into turning my mercy meter down. I wanted to show more mercy than I felt like biblically I could. Because I feel like I had bowels of mercies. Look, I've blown it too. And when you blow it, you need a little mercy. So you and I should be predisposed to be merciful. The word mercy means having the mildness and tenderness of heart which disposes someone to overlook injuries and to treat the offender better than they deserve. Number four, quickly. Forbearing and forgiving requires selflessness. The word is kindness. You know, I never really studied the word kindness because you already think you know what it means, and you sort of do. But the dictionary actually says that it means the temper or disposition which delights in contributing to the happiness of others. In other words, that it is your disposition to want to make others happy. Kindness. Kindness is a noun. Now here's what happens. Someone injures me. If I'm not careful, if I'm not who I should be, my first desire will be for justice to be done and vindication. But there are times when Vindication and justice should be overweighed or superseded by kindness. And maybe it's best for me, I think, but maybe it's best for them that I'm just kind to them. The 
This is not our nature. To be good to someone who's hurting you. And even in doing good, you have to be careful about your spirit because you can have that coals of fire on their head mentality. Well, I'll show them. I'll be nice to them. That'll make them feel bad. Uh, that's not quite what we're talking about here. I'll set their head on fire. I'll, be, I'll bake them a cake. Here, take the, I love you. <laughs> Forbearing and forgiving requires selflessness. You see, you have, to, you have to take yourself out of the picture a little bit and think about them more than yourself. And we are, for the most part, very self-centered creatures. Number five, forbearing and forgiving requires humility. The phrase here in the Bible is humbleness of mind. Now let me say this to you. If you find yourself oft offended, if you are often offended, you probably are not humble. It ought to be very difficult to offend you. Amen. It ought to be very difficult. It ought to be nigh to impossible to offend you to where you lose it. Forbearing and forgiving requires a humble mind. Interesting, it didn't say a humble heart, although that's associated with it, but a humble mind. Taking great offense at personal offenses is a sign of being high-minded. The Christian should be able to be injured without being offended. Did you hear what I said? You should be able to be injured without being offended because of your humility. Now, this is not easy. It requires great humility of mind. But 1 Peter 5.5 5 talks about being clothed with humility. Now listen. For the last 20 years, and I hear some of y'all say this, and I think, are you ever going to learn? For 20 years, the secular world and psychology and psychiatrists have taught you to pump yourself up and think more of yourself. And that that is the answer for all of life's troubles. That is nowhere found in the scripture. Just the opposite is what is found. You need to make your mind up. You're going to quit listening to Oprah and Sally Jolly Raphael, wherever she's buried, and Dr. Phil, and listen to the word of God that, that nowhere says your problem is you think too little of yourself. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does it say your problem is you need to think more highly of yourself. No, from cover to cover it says you already think too much of yourself. There is, a, there is an idea that, that your, your contentiousness is based in the fact that you're somehow overreacting to your low self-esteem. No, it's because you're proud. Right. It's not that you don't think enough of yourself, it's you already think too much of yourself. Listen. You either got to make up your mind you believe the Bible or you don't. And I'm telling you, you just try to find anywhere in the scripture where it says you ought to think more of yourself than you already do. It is not there. Everywhere you see about self-image, it is you got to lower it some. You got to push it down a little. Because it is a natural instinct of man to think too much of himself. That is why you're always offended. That is why we are contentious. By the way, Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride cometh contention. So these contentious people are prideful people. And that's God's opinion. And His opinion is absolutely correct. Now, James said, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, which war in your members. In other words, your flesh. So forbearing and forgiving requires humility. Listen, you will not accept, you will not be able to restrain yourself, you will not be able to absorb that blow unless you are humble in your mind.
Number six, it says forgiving or forbearing rather than forgiving requires a mild temper. The word in the Bible here is meekness. Meekness. Forbearing and forgiving requires a mild temper. The word meekness means softness of temper, mildness, gentleness. It actually means forbearance under injuries and provocations. It means someone can poke you and you don't bite them. You're our little dog, Sterling. And I should call him by his proper name, Lord Sterling. Lord Sterling of the branch. My kids do the weirdest things, that little dog, he never will bite them. Rebecca can make him dance, hold him by his underarms, hold him up like this and make him wiggle his tummy. It's the funniest thing you've ever seen. He is totally humiliated, I'm sure. But he just lets her do it. He doesn't snap at her, he doesn't growl at her, he doesn't, nothing. You know, he's meek. He's, got a, he's a hound. So he is just a nice dog. You could, you could do other things to him. They don't, you know, they're not ugly to him, but I'm just saying they play with him in a way that would be embarrassing for me and you. What if somebody grabs you under the arm and says, don't wiggle your belly around? You might say, stop that, leave me alone. What do you think you're doing? And you probably should, but... Here's something to think about. There's, a, there's an idea that meekness is the same thing as weakness. It's not true. Being meek does not mean you're weak. Amen. Moses, one of the best leaders ever in the history of the world, was said to be meek. It says, now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Listen, one of the great qualities of a leader is he has to be a little meek. Because if he's not, he'll be going off like a cannon all the time. You have to be, have a soft temper. A hot-headed man never makes a good leader. He may be a leader, but he won't be a good one because you've got to have a soft temper. You've got to be mild. Bobby Robertson's a great example of that. Pastor's a big old church up there. He's just got a great spirit. Now, there's some steel under there. I've seen it. But he's got a mild, soft spirit about him. He's meek. And by the way, Jesus described himself as being meek. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. So don't associate meekness with weakness. Meekness is one of the great Christian characteristics that you could have. It is one of those Christ-like things that you need to have, we all need to have, to be meek, to be soft of temper. Listen, there is nothing virtuous about being a hothead. To be mild, to be gentle. One of the qualifications of a pastor is he'd be gentle. Did you know that? Be gentle. You know why? He can't be reactionary. He can't just fly off the handle at the drop of a hat and get, get angry. So forbearing and forgiving requires a mild temper. And then lastly, I have two minutes before the kids come storming down the stairs. Forbearing and forgiving requires endurance. The word here is long-suffering. Now, the word long-suffering means this, bearing injuries or provocation for a long time. It is not just patience. Patience can mean you're just waiting for something. But long-suffering means you're suffering long. It means you have, you're bearing injuries or provocation for a long time, not easily provoked. One of the words that's sort of a synonym is the word longanimity longanimity, and the word really means, in Latin, long mind. Long mind. So that you're, you're able to just endure and endure and endure and endure and endure and keep your attitude right. You have a long, you're long-minded. You're not easily worn away by injury and provocation. You know, somebody sticks you one time, you take it, they stick you again, you take it. But most of us have the three strike rule, right? Okay, you hit me that third time and I'm coming down to get you. But to be long-suffering means something altogether different. 
you're able to suffer provocation for a long time and to carry it for a long time. It, a synonym to forbearance, patience, disposition to endure under long offenses. Um, did you know this? And I'll, I'll close with this. One of the keys to, to knowing anyone for a long time, ask yourself this question. How many, I'm not talking about your family, they're stuck with you. How many friends do you have you've had for 10 years? Or are your friends like a revolving door in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out? I'll tell you a secret. Everybody looks good when you first meet them. Everybody looks great when you, oh, they are such a breath of fresh air. Did you meet them? They are awesome. Six months, oh, they stink. No, they're human. And what happened was, you just were around them long enough to see their freckles. And Brother Harper there. From here, he looks, well, maybe from here. Uh, from here, from here, he looks, no, maybe from over here. From here, he looks tolerable. I cannot see the hairs in his ears. I trust that they are there, like mighty antenna on a grasshopper. I cannot see freckles and moles and other things, gigantic pores in his skin. Can't see anything. From, from here he looks wonderful. But if you get right up there on him now, I mean, you get right over here on top of it. And I can pick on him because we pay him. And... Uh, <laughs> He's got a couple scars. Surely does. He cut himself right there with his razor this morning. <laughs> Missing a little bit on top too, isn't he? <laughs> He's still got a few. He's going to lose the rest of it, I think, before it's over. <laughs> See, the closer you get someone, you notice their defects. <laughs> right? Now, I know you don't have any. I understand that. You notice their defects. See, when you first meet somebody, you're over here. Man, what a breath of fresh air. He was actually nice. But then, when you get closer, and you see their humanity. See, everybody looks better from afar. But we have this thing about wanting to be close to people. And then when we get closer, we're like, ugh! Defect! Nose hair! <laughs> Freckles! Well, yeah, and you got them too. You got them too. So, don't be shocked. Don't blow a gizzard. Because when you get close to someone or some group or some company, you suddenly realize, oh, they're not perfect. No. They're not, and neither are you. There'll be no perfect ones until you get to heaven. In the meantime, you've got to forbear and forgive just about everybody that you want to keep your relationship with. If you want to grow old and alone, if you want to be sitting somewhere in a chair by yourself when you're 70, 80 years old, just do not practice forbearance and forgiveness. And eventually those around you will walk away from you. Or you'll kick them out. And you'll find out that nobody that you ever will know for very long, pretty well, doesn't need your forbearance and your forgiveness. And that's the way you maintain your friendships, your business associations. You know, one day we had, and I'm over now, but that's, that's different. The guys here that service our coffee machines, we use duplicating products. We've been using them since we opened our doors. And here lately, about a year ago, they did something totally ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. Now, they had served us well. And they, they did us wrong. And I said to them, you know what? I said, you know what? Uh, you'll have to do something a whole lot more than that for me to kick you out of here. 
I'm not going to run you off because you did us wrong one time. Because you guys have served us well for years. Now, they made it right. Because I want to maintain a good relationship with them. I like them. They do a good job for us. And one time or two times or three times over 15 years is not enough for me to say, get out of here. Right? Because every company makes mistakes. And they surely made one. Forbearing and forgiving. I recommend them whenever I can, even though they made a couple mistakes. I recommend them because they have done a good job for us. Shall we stand, please? Let's uh, pray together and be dismissed. I'll meet you outside and say goodbye. And uh, Brother Powers, would you please dismiss the service?